Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. In these days of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're disseminating as much high-quality, evidence-based information and expert opinion about the situation as we can in our special bonus COVID-19 episodes. Meanwhile, we still want to support you in your nursing career development, so please enjoy this interview recorded prior to this global emergency. Be well, stay safe, and many blessings on you, your loved ones, your colleagues, your communities, and everyone on this troubled yet beautiful planet of ours. Can a CRNA become a serial nurse entrepreneur and launch several successful businesses, all while living an awesome life? Let's talk all about it with nurse entrepreneur and podcaster Jason Duprat, right here on episode 271 of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello, welcome to the Nurse Keith Show. I love having you along for this ride. Whether you're new to the show or you've been on this journey with me for months or years, as always, I thank you for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. This podcast is all about you and your nursing career, and I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, and beyond. And did you know the Nurse Keith Coaching is your one-stop shop for all things related to your career? That's right. I offer individualized coaching for nurses and healthcare professionals around the world. And if you mention you're a listener, you get 10% off your first coaching package. Email me today at keith at nursekeith.com and we can schedule a complimentary consult to explore how coaching with me can help you have the most satisfying life and career possible. Meanwhile, if you want to see the show notes for this episode, which as always, I highly recommend, you can follow along at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 271. Anyway, today we're welcoming friend of the pod, Jason Duprat, a CRNA, nurse entrepreneur, podcaster, and so much more. And Jason, we're going to get right into it, okay? Sounds great. The first thing I understand about you is that you are a serial entrepreneur all while being a CRNA. So what's your clinical background and then how did you leverage that into entrepreneurship? How did that all come about? Yeah, Keith, thanks for having me on the show. I'm super excited to be here and and talk with your audience a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, so as far as my clinical background goes, um, I'll I'll actually go way back to uh, preclinical just briefly. And because my original degree, my first degree was in hotel and resort management. And I actually started my career as a restaurateur. So I was a restaurant manager um, of an IHOP, believe it or not. And um, that was quite the experience. And it didn't take me long to realize that that wasn't the career field for me. Okay. So I very quickly went back to, to school and started doing uh, you know, the nursing school prerequisites while I was still working uh, as a nurse manager or as a restaurant manager. And, um, and eventually ended up going to nursing school in Florida, graduated, got my first job in the emergency room. And uh, transitioned after one year into the intensive care unit. Um, It was a medical surgical ICU, uh, still in Orlando. And then from there, I applied to nurse anesthesia school and uh, trained all around Orlando. We trained at about five or six different uh, hospital facilities, including um, Orlando Regional Medical Center, which was the level one trauma center. And um, learned a massive amount of information uh, in a very short period of time and gained a lot of experience clinically um, through that program. Yeah, and I still practice as a CRNA uh, here in Daytona. I actually moved back from um, mm-hmm. from New Mexico, which is the um, same area you're from. I, I spent about three years over there practicing as a CRNA. Moved back to Florida, which is where I'm at now, and I just practice uh, about six or seven days a month, um, just enough to keep my license and uh, stay credentialed in the Navy. So I just uh, do it just to keep my hands um, Keep my hands in there. So, yeah. Keep your hands in the game, right? Credentialed in the Navy. Wait a second. That's right. That is in your bio. So, tell us a little bit about about the Navy connection, just so any audience member is thinking, like, what? The Navy? What's that about? 
Yeah, so I'm a Navy reservist and I joined the Navy back in 2011. So as soon as I got my acceptance letter from anesthesia school, uh, nurse anesthetist happened to be on the critical shortage list. And so they were offering us the same package that they were offering physicians who are also on the critical shortage list. And um, so that package included um, something called a training and medical specialties program. So as soon as I got into anesthesia school, um, you know, I did the application, which is actually nine months long, believe it or not, um, to get in, uh, filled with lots of security clearances and, and all that stuff. But no um, I was commissioned as an officer and um, accepted into the TMS program. And in that program, they essentially give you a stipend while you're in school. Not much, just enough to sort of survive on and limit your student loans. And then they pay back some of your student loans when you graduate. And so now I've been in for um, going on nine years. And wow. Yeah, I love it. We do the, as a reservist, we do, um, you know, one weekend a month typically at a minimum. And that's at a Navy um, training center. And then we do two weeks um, somewhere at a Navy hospital. And we actually administer anesthesia during those two weeks. So last rotation, I was in Rota, Spain, which was pretty cool. And this time, uh, in just another month, I go to Pensacola to work at the Navy hospital there. Cool. Wow. And that's as a CRNA, of course. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. So you've had a robust clinical experience. You joined the Navy, became a CRNA and CRNAs obviously are very highly trained, specialized nurses and probably have the highest earning power of most APRNs out there, if not the highest. And I'm curious, not about your bank account. I'm actually curious, you know, what happened in your life that made you think, oh, I can actually like create um, entrepreneurial endeavors. And did it start as like a little side hustle or did you jump in feet first and just go like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur now? So sort of it, I've always had an interest in business. Um, hence my first degree was in management. Um, I just didn't really know what my what my career path was going to look like exactly. So I mm -hmm. uh, ended up going obviously clinical and then, you know, but as a kid, I'd always done entrepreneurial type things. I literally had a lemonade stand. This is like the most cliche story of every entrepreneur, but I had one of those, awesome. I sold baseball cards. I had um, in high school, I was the first person in my high school to have a CD burner. And so I was downloading MP3s. Um, it may not have been the most legal uh, business structure, but downloading MP3s off the internet and making custom CDs for all my classmates. And then that sort of um, died off a little bit, um, the entrepreneurial drive, just because I was so busy working as a manager and studying in college and things. Mm. And then um, actually in nursing school, um, I actually bought a hot dog cart, believe it or not, and ran a hot dog cart for a very short period of time. During nursing school? During nursing school, yep. Uh -huh. Did you like check your customers' blood pressures, like to <laughs> to test your clinical I, skills I while, while sold serving that. hot dogs? <laughs> I should have added that as like a bonus. Yes. No kidding. <laughs> check your blood pressure while you're eating this high sodium <laughs> hot dog and sauerkraut. Yeah, exactly. And I know CPR is an added bonus. <laughs> right. Love it. Yep. <laughs> So tell me, tell me, you know, from the hot dog cart, which I thought, I think some of your classmates might have thought was um, entertaining, maybe? Yep. Yep. yep, I thought it was crazy. Um, yep. Did you get like mustard and sauerkraut on a lot of your papers as you were writing them behind the counter? <laughs> <laughs> so this was actually um, very, just about the first two semesters, I ended up closing down the hot dog cart business. Um, so it was right before nursing school and into the first few semesters before I realized nursing school was way harder than I thought it was going to be. So, so that, that business was put on hold um, and actually just, just shut down. But um, yeah, once I became um, you know, a CRNA, I'm, like I said, I moved to New Mexico, which was where sort of the entrepreneurial thing started to um, get kicked back up again because in New Mexico, nurse practitioners and nurse anesthetists are independent clinicians. And so they don't need um, a supervising physicians to practice, which uh, really broadens the entrepreneurial, you know, opportunities that are out there. And so I ended up starting my own practice uh, while I was still working full time. And so that was sort of my, my side hustle. Wow. Now I understand that you know, and yeah, New Mexico is a hotbed of entrepreneurship, probably because there aren't a lot of well-paying jobs. Yeah. Um, it's a very poor state. But, you know, a lot of people do get the bug here, myself included, and reinvent themselves. So 
My understanding is that one of your main businesses, one of the things that you've leveraged into a money-making opportunity as a nurse entrepreneur is ketamine therapy. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So there's sort of a little bit of a yeah backstory that goes to that. And essentially, um, shortly before moving to New Mexico, I had an emergency room physician call me. Um, one of my colleagues in school who was a CRNA student had given him my contact information and he was starting a ketamine infusion therapy practice in um, Texas. And so he was looking for some input from an anesthesia provider since ketamine's um, FDA approved as an anesthetic and that's the most common use for it. So he just wanted to pick my brain a little bit and that sort of um, sparked my interest in that there were there was an alternative use for ketamine. I had never heard of that in school. The only reason that we had learned about it was as an anesthetic. And so that just sort of was um, burning in the back of my mind after talking to him. I started to pull some studies off the databases at the hospital and started to do my own research. You know, that was in 2016. And so it was very, very new back then. And that's sparked my interest in my research and things sort of evolved from there into me starting my own, my own practice in 2017. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop you there for a second. There's someone out there saying, what the heck is ketamine? I've heard of it, but I have no idea what it does. Yeah. So ketamine um, was originally FDA approved as a general anesthetic and it's used pretty commonly, especially in labor and delivery, which was um, one of my primary practice locations as an, as an anesthetist. Um, if you have like a failed epidural, we'll administer ketamine and it causes a dissociative state. Um, and so the best way sort of to describe that is sort of like your minds disconnecting from your body. You still are in full control of your limbs and everything, but it's sort of, um, it's a, it's an interesting experience. There's no other drugs that sort of act like that, but it's a disconnecting type of experience. And so if somebody's, you know, going through a procedure and they're having pain, we, we administer that and their mind doesn't register the pain. Um, it's a, an NMDA receptor antagonist and um, the pharmacology gets pretty complex, but it's, uh, that's basically the gist of it. It also works for, um, which is what this ER physician had taught me. It's, it works for depression. Um, and new studies are showing that it works for PTSD and for chronic pain, not just acute pain. And so it's a pretty amazing drug. And uh, the studies that are coming out uh, showing the, the things that it can be useful for is pretty astounding and, and really starting to kick up. Yeah, I've heard about it being used for depression. There's a clinic here in Santa Fe, probably run by someone you may know, I'm not sure, but they do use it for depression. And people have described it as somewhat like a psychedelic experience where you actually have someone with you the whole time in case you have any, you know, psychic distress that happens or emotional distress. So is that your experience as well, that when you administer ketamine for say depression or PTSD, that it's sort of like you're there with them for this guided experience? Is that the gist of it? Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. So JAMA Psychiatry released a consensus guidelines in 2017, which sort of um, gave some indications as far as like what should be monitored um, and sort of set the standard of care when it comes to ketamine. And um, many clinics are still using that standard or at least starting there. But uh, what I've found over the last few years is that many clinicians um, through their own experience feel that that low, ultra low dose is... Um, not very effective and that a certain level of dissociation has to be reached. And so, you know, obviously in really high doses, ketamine can cause hallucinations and that dissociate, like really um, significant dissociation. But um, in, in the lower doses that it's being used for um, mood disorders, it, it causes dissociation. It causes um, a little bit of uh, I guess the best way to describe it is sort of a floaty feeling. Um, it doesn't really cause euphoria like, you know, like an opioid receptor agonist would. It works on an entirely different mechanism, so it's, it's not addictive physically. Some, some people can get psychologically addicted to it just because they like that sort of uh, floaty, dissociated mm -hmm. feeling. But to answer your question a little bit better, yes, dissociation, which is a little bit higher dosing, um, sort of starts to enter into that low dose psychedelic type realm of, of therapy. And then yes, the clinics, the clinicians are always there watching the patient very closely. Um, they're on monitors and 
One of the newest developments is the uh, creation of a psychedelic assisted therapy credential. And so a lot of clinics are now offering ketamine therapy with, along with, you know, mental health counseling and, and uh, ketamine assisted psychotherapy. Yep. Wow. So that's assisted. So it's, um, assisted psychedelic therapy so it's um it's a uh, yeah ketamine um assisted psychedelic therapy yep i see now what i've been hearing these days is that you know there there's a lot of research going into microdosing of psychedelics whether it's mdma also known as ecstasy which is being they're using it in trials for PTSD and dementia and depression, I think something, something. along those lines, and then also um, psilocybin. And of course, Ram Das died recently over on Maui, and he and Timothy Leary were doing research at Harvard back in the '60s, and they both got kicked out of Harvard for it, very famously. So things have come a long way since the days of. Leary and Ram Das experimenting with graduate students at Harvard. Um, so for you to get into this as a nurse, as a CRNA, this is FDA approved and you're able to do this above board. And are there any risks involved for you liability wise? Like what's the liability if someone out there is listening and they're like, yeah, I'd like to do that. What do they have to worry about or be concerned about here? To answer the first question, is it FDA approved? So ketamine is FDA approved as an anesthetic and an analgesic. So um, pain reliever, essentially, was its original approved use. Now, ketamine is generic, and the thing with the issue with FDA approval and seeking FDA approval for a new use with a generic is the, is the cost. And essentially, there's nobody who's going to fund um, moving a, a generic drug through the FDA approval process because it's known to cost a hundred million all the way up to a billion dollars to move a drug through the FDA approval process. And so it'll never happen for a generic because there's no pharmaceutical companies backing it um, who can make, you know, that return on their investment. And so it's, it's approved as an analgesic and anesthetic and, um, but that's not to say that it can't be used for other purposes. Um, if you do a little Google searching, you can find out that uh, 20 to 25% of all prescriptions in the U.S. are prescribed for a non-FDA approved indication. Um, many drugs, after they originally come out for one indication, are found to be really beneficial for something totally different. Viagra is actually a perfect example of that. That was originally approved for pulmonary hypertension. And now it's being used to treat uh, erectile dysfunction. So, Right. Okay. So you can safely and legally administer this for ketamine-assisted psychedelic psychotherapy or for directly working with someone on PTSD or depression. So you ran into people who were doing this and got involved. And how did you actually turn it into a business? Like how do you, as a, as a, independent provider, what do you do in order to make this into a business and how viable is it as a business? Yeah. So when I started doing my research, what I found was that there were very few practices um, doing it in the U.S. And basically that JAMA psychiatry guideline that was published basically was my personal green light because it's it was so new at the time in 2016 when I first started to look into it. I wasn't comfortable doing it. There was maybe a couple dozen studies on the use of ketamine for treatment resistant depression or which is basically the, the newest indication for it. And I just personally felt it was a little too risky. There's always issues being at the very forefront of something because you're essentially paving the trail for everybody else to come follow you. And when you're paving that trail, you are absolutely going to get cut up by the briar bushes and everything else coming at you. And so once that JAMA Psychiatry Consensus Guideline was published, you know, there's one major, major journal who says, okay, everybody, this is a using ketamine for depression is an acceptable treatment option. There's enough data that says it works. There still needs to be more data. Here's what we think you should do in order to safely administer it and meet the criteria to, um, and what the criteria your patients should meet in order to um, be able to receive this type of therapy. And so in there, they, they describe what criteria 
what the criteria are. And to that to them is failing to at least to traditional antidepressants. So it's not a first line therapy. There's still too many unknowns um, as far as long term side effects to recommend it as a first line therapy. This is essentially a last line therapy. Most of the patients that come in have already tried shock therapy, ECT. They've already tried transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation. And so ketamine is sort of a last resort for many patients. And in that case, it's absolutely more than appropriate to uh, administer, but the basic minimum standard is failing at least to antidepressants. I see. And if you follow those guidelines, the, the risk and liability is very low. There's been multiple journals now that have um, published guidelines on the use of ketamine for chronic pain, for acute pain, now for um, treatment resistant depression. And now there's a new society called the American Society of Ketamine Physicians that was established two years ago. And it's, it has all the heavy hitting researchers in the ketamine therapy space um, as part of it, sharing knowledge and creating standards around the use. Excellent. Um, so the American Society of Ketamine Physicians, we'll have a link to that in the show notes and to JAMA Psychiatry as well. And before we take a break, this is a viable business venture. Like you can actually earn money doing this as an independent provider or as a group, right? Oh yeah. This is just like any other medical practice. Um, and some people don't even, don't even start just a ketamine infusion therapy practice. A lot of um, medical providers already have a practice and they are looking for other ways to generate um, extra income for their practice and to also help patients at the same time uh, with treatments that actually work. And, um, and so this is a good model for people to add into an existing practice or there's been many hundreds of clinics now around the country that, that specialize just in ketamine infusion therapy. And so, yeah, it's definitely a viable, a viable business model. Right now, it's all a self-pay model, and mm-hmm. um, until insurance reimburses, it'll stay self-pay. That was another question. Thank you for answering it. And we're going to take a really quick break, Jason. When we come back, I want to talk with you about entrepreneurship in general, and especially as a healthcare provider, you know, the hacks, the lessons learned, the things that you think are absolute musts if you want to be a healthcare entrepreneur, and then. Before we finish, we'll talk about developing online courses and what that means for your Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy. And of course, we'll touch base about your podcast as well, which I've been a guest on and was very happy to do so. So we'll be right back for the second half of the Nurse Keith Show. So now we're going to take a pause for the cause for just a moment. Please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash nurse Keith. And if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me, please consider referring them. And if they become a paying client, you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me. And there's no expiration date on that credit. So you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most. And remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits. What an incredible deal. And please head over to nursekeith.com and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages, updates from my blog and my podcast, resources, and all sorts of other stuff. Remember, nursekeith.com, sign up for that newsletter, and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you. Anyway, those are my sincere asks today. So now, Let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. Hey, thanks for hanging out here on the Nurse Keith Show. We are with Jason Duprat. He is a CRNA down in Florida, sunny Florida. And we were just speaking before the break, Jason, about ketamine therapy and also your history as a CRNA and also as a naval officer serving as a CRNA in the Army Reserve. So thank you for your service. And, you know, we were just talking about ketamine therapy and the ways in which it can be leveraged as an entrepreneurial venture. Now, in terms of entrepreneurship, you know, what's the journey been like and what's one of the 
best, hardest, or most, most notable lessons you've learned on the entrepreneurial path? Yeah, so definitely when it comes to lessons learned, there have been a multitude of lessons learned along the way. And I would say the first one probably starts with my, you know, my initial business venture, which was the hot dog cart in that I did not, when I started that hot dog cart, do enough uh, market research before I got started. I got a little overexcited, a little gung-ho, bought the hot dog cart, got my licenses and food handler certificate and all that, and then started and then realized in Orlando, which was unlike the market that I had studied before, which was Chicago, hot dog carts just can't set up on any corner. There's actually codes against it. Oh, no. And so I learned that lesson the hard way. Oh, and darn. had to, Yeah. So I had to pay rent. And so we were paying rent at like Harbor Freight and different hardware stores. And uh, very quickly realized that once you subtract out the couple hundred dollars a day that these people want, that the profit margins just make it not worth standing in that Florida sun hours at a time. So that's one major lesson that I learned is, is you know, sort of controlling your emotions when it comes to business and entrepreneurship and these new ideas that are, are um, presented to you and uh, really doing due diligence and market research before you jump in and uh, you know, don't get that shiny object syndrome and just rush into making a decision or making a big purchase. So luckily that business was pretty inexpensive to start, a couple thousand. So I didn't like, and I went back and sold all my stuff and maybe I lost, I don't know, Five hundred thousand dollars on the whole deal, but that's not too bad, really. <laughs> it was a good learning experience. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. So you do your market research. You keep your emotions under in check because you can get super excited and kind of lose the forest for the trees in a way, right? You're exactly. like, oh wow, that looks really cool. Let me do this, this, and that, and then you lose sight of the bigger picture. You never pull the camera back to say, wait a second. Let me get a bird's eye view here and see if this is really viable. So that's a good lesson. And how about a good hack that you've learned along the way as a nurse healthcare entrepreneur? A really good hack that you found is just invaluable. So one of the hacks that I learned as I got started with our online course um, system is that, uh, and it's getting to be a little bit more well-known now, but it wasn't a couple of years ago when we got started, but there's websites or apps on your phone that you can go to. And if you need a designer to design you a logo, if you need a virtual assistant, if you need somebody to answer your emails, if you need somebody to be a podcast manager, there are app, app, these applications or websites where you can post a job for freelancers. So these are people who are working for themselves. And you know, on these websites, they have profiles and descriptions of what their expertise is and a range of what they charge. And you can post jobs and, and hire people on these types of websites for a fraction of what it costs sometimes to actually hire an employee. That's very true. So that was like biggest game changer that I've uh, experienced in the last three years was learning how to leverage independent contractors that are, that you can employ from around the world. That's the benefit is that sometimes you can get somebody who speaks wonderful English from the Philippines who will work for seven or $8 an hour U S and in their area, their, um, And in their currency, that is like a phenomenal wage for them. And they will do a a killer job for you. And so leveraging that sort of worldwide employment market is a phenomenal hack to get started. You can, you don't have to hire full time. You can do by project, you can do part time. And it makes it a super flexible way to get the help that you need to grow your business um, or market your business or anything else that you need. So it's, it's, I recommend that to anybody. And a couple of those websites are upwork.com and freelancer.com and there's a, there's a handful of other ones. Those are the top two. Yeah. The ones I've used are Upwork, Fiverr, and 99designs. What was the second one you mentioned? Uh, freelancer.com is a good one. Oh, freelancer.com. Right. And for anyone listening who's like, what about Odesk? I'll just say that Odesk turned into Upwork a number of years ago. And Actually, funny you mentioned the Philippines. My virtual assistant, Mark Happy Spiesen, who helps with the podcast and social media and my newsletter, he's in the Philippines. He's a nurse entrepreneur, actually. So he really understands healthcare mm-hmm. and it's awesome. And yes, they do charge less than people here in the States. And some people say, you know, is there a moral or ethical issue with hiring out of the country? And I can say, yes, maybe there is a moral or ethical issue in terms of creating jobs, but 
I also love helping people who are in places where they need a lot of help and need work. And I give him, I've given him regular raises and bonuses for his birthday and Christmas. So I try to make it really work and I try to be as generous as possible. And of course I could hire someone here, but he's doing such an amazing job. Like you said, he's, his work ethic is just incredible. So I totally get that. And I've found podcast producers on Upwork. I've found graphic designers. So you sounds like you've had a similarly positive experience hiring people freelance. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and I do get that sort of moral dilemma um, in that mm-hmm. we're taking away American jobs. Um, but honestly, if you're, in, if you're going to be in business, if you're just starting out, Everybody, everybody, other, everybody, other, uh, all the other business owners are doing very similar things. And so in order to remain competitive, um, I think that's a phenomenal way to get started because you can keep your labor expense to minimum, you know, as things grow, if you want to hire, you know, American employees and, you know, convert back. I think that that's an option, but right out of the gate, I think that it's just, uh, extremely Expensive. So unless you have, you know, a large amount of capital to play around with when you're getting started, then I think independent contractors, international are a great way to go. Very good point. Yeah. And all of my podcast producers have been here in the US, though my current one's in Canada, and he's wonderful. And of course, there's always moral and ethical dilemmas in healthcare, in business. We run into them all the time, you know, and, and there can be cognitive dissonance around that. But then I think, you know, I'm helping support an entrepreneur in the Philippines who has a family and a child, and it's really helping him live a better life. So, you know, you have to weigh these things. So what's one more hack that you found super, super helpful that you'd recommend to someone listening who is thinking of starting a business or maybe has the makings of a business already? Yeah. So I would actually sort of, um, they're, they're very related. So the first hack is podcasts. I think podcasts related to entrepreneurship and business are absolutely phenomenal. That's why I started my podcast um, because there was nobody talking about healthcare um, entrepreneurship. And so I've filled that niche. But when I got started, even before I got started, I listened to like literally a year of podcasts. All my, one of my favorites was JLD, like Entrepreneurs on Fire. That guy was, um, his shows were absolutely phenomenal. He had Don a, Lee Dumas. Yeah, he's awesome. He, he did an episode a day for like, I don't remember, five years or something. So he you can did. never run out of he information did. to learn. And he had some great guests on. So that's definitely one of the hacks that I think is phenomenal. You don't need an MBA. I have one. I'm telling you, it's not worth it. If you're going to go into um, to entrepreneurship, MBAs, I feel like teach you how to be managers of mid to large corporations. Yes. They, they are not designed to help you be a phenomenal entrepreneur, at least most of them. And uh, most of them, they all have the same curriculum anyways, if you go to an accredited school. So you're going to get extremely similar content. Some may have an entrepreneurship track. I tried that. My first entrepreneur, um, my first teacher in the entrepreneurship track never owned a business. So that was like, okay, I'm done with that. <laughs> I'm going to drop that certificate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you heard it here first, folks, from from Jason Duprat that an MBA is not necessary to have a business. Yeah, absolutely not. And then sort of to piggyback off of that podcasting, um, you know, by following John Lee Dumas, listening to his podcast, I actually learned about masterminds and what those were and joined him on two masterminds in Puerto Rico at his house, which was a phenomenal experience. And being able to network really closely with other entrepreneurs is, is just an awesome way to really uh, accelerate the growth of your uh, business and your business knowledge. And so I'd highly recommend doing some sort of a mastermind or at least um, networking very closely with some entrepreneurs who are several steps ahead of you because they can help accelerate your path. Right. Hang out with people and talk to and listen and read about people who know more than you do. I mean, exactly. that's that's one of the basis is, bases of business is learn from other people. And, you know, I don't have a business degree. I've never taken a business course in my life. And yes, I've made mistakes. Yes, things could have been easier. Maybe I could be more successful now if I was smarter or savvier. But I also hire business coaches. I'm working with one right now. So you hire the people you need when you need them and you learn what you need I, uh, isn't in nursing, don't we often call it in healthcare, um, um, just in time learning, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yep. That whole notion that you can't learn everything about running a business all at the same time. You'd pull your hair out. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, right. So what do you feel you're doing with your Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy and the courses that you have? How do you feel like you're making a difference for healthcare entrepreneurs, whether they're doctors, PTs, et cetera? And how are you providing motivation and education and inspiration to those people? What happens in that academy? Yeah, so the the actual, um, so to back up just a little bit, so I have the Ketamine Academy. We have another course called the IV Nutritional Therapy Academy. Both teach how to start practices. And um, essentially, those are very niche businesses. They're very, um, you know, small target markets. And so in order to um, step back and sort of unniche a little bit, we created the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy brand. And that is sort of the overarching brand um, in which we launched a podcast. And the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy podcast is literally just a free resource that we put out. Um, And I decided to do podcasting because that's what helped me the most. And uh, I interview successful healthcare entrepreneurs from all around the world. And they talk about their business model. They talk about their struggles. They talk about their successes. They give advice on what it takes to um, make it to their level. And, and hopefully it helps, you know, all the listeners, um, one, see that it's capable of being accomplished. There are so many different business models out there Two, I hope it fills the gap. Um, the knowledge gap that we all have as nurses and as medical professionals, because we get little to no business training in the course of our normal education. And so I feel like this is a fantastic way to get some education in the business uh, world and see what sort of opportunities exist out there other than just, you know, working at the bedside, being stuck in the hospital all the time, um, which isn't for everybody. That's sort of what's got me burnt out. I was working sometimes 90 hours a week between 24 hour shifts um, covering the OB department in, in Albuquerque. And that's sort of what sparked my initial you know, desire to, to try and figure out a different way to make an income that didn't involve me spending my nights uh, alone in a twin bed, oftentimes 90 hours a week. So that's where the clinic started. And then from the clinic, we launched two online courses. Now we have this podcast that we launched, uh, we just put it out there for free. And we're hoping to develop more courses in and partner with experts in the healthcare entrepreneur entrepreneurship space who have, you know, a unique business model that's, that definitely works that we could teach to others and then create more courses around that. So that's the the future. So Jason, as we slowly start to wind down the conversation here, you know, podcasting, blogging, et cetera, I always consider that and many people consider that content marketing. Like you need to reach out to your audience with generally free, valuable content to, to, I always say it's kind of like you have to demonstrate your expertise. You have to demonstrate your knowledge so that people will know, like, and trust you. So you use a podcast and you have a very robust website people can visit. And what is the website people should visit to, to find out more about the Academy and about what you do? Yes. Yeah, so the website is Jason. Um, it's spelled J-A-S-O-N, Duprat, D-U-P-R-A-T dot com. That's it. And if you want to go straight to the podcast information, you can go jasonduprat.com forward slash listen, and that takes you straight to the podcast episodes. Great. And I'm on the website here. It's a lovely website. And it says, Stop Existing, Start Living with Jason A. Duprat. And you have lots of information here. You have the podcast, you have your courses, the team, and your story, and a wonderful picture of you as a little boy. Were you about six years old there? Uh, Yeah, I think so. And was that the lemonade stand um, age? (laughs) (laughs) I think the lemonade stand, I was probably about seven or eight. So not too far after that. Seven or eight. Okay. Well, you were, you were very adorable then and you still are. And, you know, it's very sweet to have that picture (laughs) of yourself there. That's really, that's really cute. So, you know, you have your, you have a branding and podcast manager, you have a digital marketer, you have another digital marketer and a virtual assistant. So you have quite a team assembled and I think that's really wonderful. And it's hard to put together a team because, we're working so hard in our business or on our business that sometimes we feel a little put upon to do all the things we need to do. And I guess that's one reason you and I each have a virtual assistant because doesn't it come to a point where you're bootstrapping, like you're really running on a shoestring and you realize, Oh my God, 
there's so much more that I could do and I need to spend a little money to make money. Have you run into that space several times throughout the course of your business career? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, for sure. I mean, initially, there's not much money to go around. You know, even no. as a CRNA, we make a lot of money, but it's, I had a heck of a lot of student loans back then. Um, thank God they're paid off now. But there wasn't a lot of money to go around. Um, and so at, initially, it was just me and my wife. Uh, you know, we made our own yeah. website. We did all the own, we wrote our own emails. We, we, start to learn um, email, uh, CRM software and email software. Like everything from scratch was, was just mostly me and my wife helped when she could. And so there's, there definitely comes a point where you are burning the candle at both ends, especially since you're, most people start off you know, working somewhere else uh, in the bootstrapping their business. And so it, it gets to be super uh, overwhelming. At some point, you just have to, if you want to keep growing, if you want to keep providing great service to your clients um, and a great product, then you're going to have to build out a team. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you can stay small if you want to. That's no problem. Uh, it depends on people's you know, preferences. But if you want to grow your business, at some point you have to, to, to figure out ways to scale it. And, and one of the number one ways is to definitely start building out a team. And it's hard. It is really hard to build out a team. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> We've yeah. gone through so many um, contractors that haven't worked out. And that's just part of what it takes. Uh, you know, some people aren't going to work out. Some people will promise everything and not deliver. Um, some people uh, do a great job and then something happens, you know, personally and they can't work anymore. So there's a lot of things that happen and it takes a lot of work to build out that team. But once you have a team, then it's a, and a team that people that really work well together and, and produce good quality uh, work, then it's time to make sure that you pay them really well and, you know, treat them like their family for sure. Once they, once they prove their weight. Absolutely. That's so true. And, you know, there's risk involved, right? In starting a business, there's risk involved in becoming a nurse. I mean, we're always taking risks and these are calculated risks in our lives. And if you're hiring a stranger who lives across the world, you're going a little bit on trust, right? Plus their, their reputation on say upwork.com or something. But there's this point at which you have to take calculated risks. Like I recently hired a business coach to help me with my website and kind of repackaging my whole brand and my courses and all the things I'm building for the Nurse Keith Nation. And I had to put out a considerable amount of money to work with a pretty high level business coach. And that is a calculated risk. So my assumption is you've taken many calculated risks along the way, right? Oh yeah, for sure. There's, there's always a calculated risk and you always want to make sure that you mitigate the risk as best as possible. And some of the easiest ways to do that when you're bringing on you know, new team members is to start them with small projects, you know, project-based work initially, very small. And maybe you even give the same project to three or four contractors and see which one does the best job and then, then start to give them more work. Um, so that's one way to sort of mitigate risk. There's, there's contracts, there's legal ways to mitigate risk. There's just sound sort of business decisions, um, you know, business thought processes um, that go along with making decisions that can help mitigate risk. Getting around other entrepreneurs, like I mentioned before, um, and bouncing ideas off of them as a way to mitigate risk. And so, yeah, business is definitely, you know, not a risk-free um, sort of venture. There's always risk. But even going to work in the hospital every day is risky. I mean, there's a certain amount of risk of getting in a car, driving down the freeway, um, hooking up a medication to a patient and giving them an IV heparin infusion. There's risks in everything we do. It's just learning how to mitigate those risks to a level that you're comfortable with and to a level that's as low as possible. Right. And some businesses like mine doing career coaching, I'm not going to kill anyone, right? Because I'm not administering anything. <laughs> I'm not giving anyone health advice. Now you're in a slightly different category here because you're a CRNA licensed advanced practice registered nurse and you're, you're actually administering ketamine for treatment of various symptoms and conditions. So you're assuming a larger risk as an entrepreneur because you're sticking your neck out in this particular way. So someone out there might be saying, well, what kind of liability insurance does Jason need for, let's say, administering ketamine as opposed to Keith doing career coaching? So you have to be pretty well protected, right? Oh yeah, for sure. So every business should have definitely business um, liability insurance which can mm -hmm. protect from a slew of different, um, you know, mishaps 
that happen, particularly like slips and falls. If you own like a, a medical practice and somebody were to slip on the tile and then try and sue right. you, that's sort of the things that, that our general business insurance would cover. If you know the, the unit next door burnt down and, and caused some of your building to catch on fire and you lose some medical equipment, it covers things like that. But, uh, in the realm of, you know, medical treatments, then you need malpractice insurance. And you can get malpractice insurance as an RN, you can get malpractice insurance as a nurse practitioner or a physician. There's varieties of different levels and amounts of coverage, and that's partially dictated by state regulations. Um, For example, in New Mexico, I believe it's a $300,000 cap on the uh, malpractice. Mm -hmm. If you join the New Mexico Patient Compensation Fund in in Florida, the standard is a million per incident or three million aggregate. Um, and so it varies depending on state. There's a lot of different regulations and things. And uh, some states have those uh, funds like New Mexico to protect medical providers from, you know, egregious lawsuits. Right. And um, yeah, good. the best way to protect yourself is to involve an attorney and make sure you have good insurance and have great contracts, um, legal entities like an LLC or a corporation to do your business from within because otherwise somebody can come after your personal assets if you don't have um, a legal entity protecting your personal assets. Exactly. Right. So those are all great, great pieces of advice. Now, as we wrap up, if someone wants to get involved in the academy, the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy, do they go to the website and sign up? And do they have like, is there a free consult? Like, how do they learn that the academy is what they actually want? Yeah, so the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy right now, it's just the the podcast and we run those two courses. Um, those two courses are actually run under two separate um, corporations and business names. But the idea is to bring everything under the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy um, here in the near future. So okay. the best way to get involved with the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy and the podcast is to go to Facebook. And then if in the search bar, you can just search Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy and there's a Facebook group there. And a lot of our podcast guests are in the group. A lot of entrepreneurs, aspiring and experienced in that group, um, having conversations about uh, business and startup and things like that. And if somebody's interested in the actual courses that we offer, which one is how to start essentially how to start a ketamine infusion therapy practice, and the other one is how to start an IV nutritional therapy practice. Oh yes. Um, so IV hydration and vitamin drips. Then the, that information is on the on their own websites, and it's also on the JasonDuprat.com website. Wonderful. Okay. So we'll have links to all of that, the ketamine infusion therapy course, the intravenous nutrient therapy course. And if someone has just a basic question before they sign up, can they just contact you on the contact page of your website and ask whatever they need to know? Oh yeah. To reach me, the best way is um, on the contact page on the, on the jasonduprat.com website is a great way to reach me. That goes straight to my email. And then okay. and also in that healthcare entrepreneur Academy group, I'm in there every single day chatting with people. And you can also shoot me a message on, you know, Instagram or uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm pretty active. I'm on those sites uh, pretty much daily. And I love interacting with, with everybody and helping as much as I can. That's really what I'm here to do is to just open up the eyes of the medical world, especially, you know, nursing and advanced practice nurses, because a lot of us just have no experience in business and we don't have any training and we don't really know what kind of opportunities are out there. And so that's what I aim to accomplish is just help people realize that there's, there's other things that you can do to leverage your current, you know, medical background and create a business around it. That's right. Right. And so people can go to jasonduprat.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-D-U-P-R-A-T, jasonduprat.com. That'll be in the show notes along. Uh, you're on Facebook, Jason Duprat, Instagram, Jason Duprat, Jason A. Duprat right? And Jason A. Duprat on pretty much every social media platform. Yeah. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We'll have all those there at Instagram. We'll have all those for listeners who want to get in touch. And, you know, you've leveraged your training. You've leveraged everything that you've done to create a great career in life for yourself. You're living in, in Florida with your family. You have your clinical practice, which you said you do six or seven shifts a month, more or less. And then you have this academy on the side and the podcast, which is your content marketing. So you have a lot of moving parts, but it also sounds like you've created the life that you want. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things I recommend to everybody before they even come up um, with a business idea or try to come up with a business idea is that they they plan out how they want their day to day life to look like, and right and start from there because there's 
going to be certain business models that you are going to want to eliminate right off the bat because it doesn't match up with your lifestyle. Maybe you don't want to work nights and weekends and holidays, then maybe if you don't want to do that, then maybe you shouldn't start a practice depending on what your specialty is. Or maybe you can only limit yourself to, you know, maybe primary care or the IV type of clinic. So you always want to start off with, you know, uh, a goal of what your future life will look like. And then from there, you start to put in some business models and business ideas that will fit your ideal uh, lifestyle. And, and then, and only then, will you be able to be happy as an entrepreneur because entrepreneurship can turn into a job. It can literally turn into oh, something yes. that you dread going into every day if you don't set it up right. And so one of the most important things is to get, to get off on the right foot um, is to start with you know, a set of objectives and goals and ideas that you want and then plan your business around that. Wow. Well, Jason, thank you for being here on the show. I had a blast being on your show. We'll have a link to my appearance on your podcast in the show notes at nursekeith.com forward slash episode 271. And thank you for being an inspiration to healthcare providers, nurses, and others to look at how to create the life and career and business opportunities, entrepreneur opportunities that they would like to have to create that life and to set up a life, manifest what they actually want and the way they would like to live. So thank you for being one of those people out there who are championing this new way of looking at a healthcare career. I really appreciate that. And I think you're doing awesome work out there. Yeah, absolutely, Keith. It's been a real pleasure. I loved our interview together too. You were actually very uh, first, you were my first interview on the computer, although I don't think it published episode number one, but that'll be in the show notes. But yeah, that was a great interview. And, um, and yeah, you gave some great advice before I even launched my podcast. So I do appreciate that. Helped me get off to a, a great start. It was awesome. My pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much. You are, you are just amazing. And I really appreciate you being here. Absolutely. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Keith. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this awesome episode of The Nurse Keith Show. Jason Duprat is the bomb. You know it. You've heard it. And remember that the show notes can be found at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 271. I hope you feel uplifted, empowered, and informed. And I encourage you to take inspired action every day in the interest of your personal and professional satisfaction and happiness, whether it's for your, your life, your lifestyle, your career, your family, whatever it is, do something every day day to take a step forward. And remember, if you need personalized holistic career coaching, hit me up at nursekeith.com, mention the show and you get 10% off your first coaching package. And did you know there are job listings and other resources at nursekeith.com? That's right. Head over to the resources tab. You'll find jobs from Reload, Trusted Health, ZipRecruiter, and lots of other resources that you're going to want to check out, including OpenMD, a free search engine for the best in evidence-based medicine. The Nurse Keith Show is adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting. Mark Cappy Spiesen is our stalwart social media ringmaster. I'm great to Rob and Mark for keeping this ship moving. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios until next time from very, very chilly but beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Jason Duprat bidding you a fond adieu from Orlando, Florida. Sunny Orlando, Florida. Bye, everybody. Sunny Orlando, Florida. Thank you so much, Jason. And we will catch everybody on the flip side.